the United Kingdom. There are dozens of political parties in the UK, but for this election on July the 4th, there are six main parties to focus on, as these are the ones with seats in the Parliament. Northern Ireland has its own messy political system, so ignore that for right now, like the rest of the UK. The UK operates under a parliamentary system, meaning the UK is divided up into hundreds of constituencies, 650 to be exact, having roughly the same number of people in them. These constituencies then elect individually their member of parliament, or MP. The Prime Minister, who is the head of the government, is typically the leader of the party with the most seats in the House of Commons. The UK has a first-past-the-post voting system, in which voters cast their ballot for one candidate, and the candidate with most votes wins, even if they do not have an absolute majority. So with that political context out of the way, let's begin with the Conservative Party or Tories. The Conservative Party is a colossus in British politics. Most UK Prime Ministers have been Conservatives, like Churchill, Thatcher, Robert Peel, Disraeli, the Marcus of Salisbury, etc. Which means they are the quote, natural governing party of the UK. But their age is beginning to show especially if you look at the current 24 polling, is one of the oldest and most successful political parties in the world. With some name being the Conservative Party, you might think they're a quite right-wing party, which isn't wrong, but it's also not right either. So they're, they're more culturally conservative, you know, moderately conservative, more, the more cautious force in politics that you see in many centre-right parties in Europe, like the People's Party in Spain and the CDU in Germany. So, for example, they are quite pro-choice. I've... I've always believed in uh, a woman's right to choose, and uh, I stick to that view. And that as well as it was a Conservative government that legalised gay marriage. The institution of marriage is now open to all. Whether you're a man and a man, a woman and a woman. Being such a massive party, that's caused quite a lot of factions, especially for a parliamentary party. So you'll have one nation Conservatives, economic Liberals, or free market Conservatives, and traditional Conservatives. So like think Jacob Rees-Mogg. However, the biggest dividing factor was and is Brexit. This quite literally smashed the perceived unity within the Conservatives. Though this division on the EU had been bubbling for decades, and since the UK joined the EU in 1973, I've always viewed Brexit within the Conservative Party as more of a cultural or historical one. Britain was an empire, the most dominant probably to ever exist. The UK is also an island, separated from the rest of mainland Europe. Historically, Britain has been quite isolationist on matters within Europe, caring much more on securing its overseas assets. These types of people are nostalgic of the power of the UK, whose influence has decreased significantly since World War II, and resent having to do any business with Europe, where they aren't even seen as a major player in Europe. This overinflated self-worth caused deep insecurities within British or English people, more specifically, as their glory days were long gone, and Brexit was seen as a symbolic and patriotic thing to do in an attempt to reclaim past glories. Some even proposed the Kansic as a trade alliance, as well as an emphasis on the Anglosphere, and strengthening ties with the US, with just the small problem of the Atlantic Ocean in the way, though again a kind of neo-British empire. Apart from Brexit though, they promote public safety, traditional values and being physically responsible. They are quite moderate, which has won many elections, but there's infighting from the more right-wing, ideological wing, which want them to be more unapologetically conservative rather than, you know, compassionate conservative. You put a human face on the Tory party, you've called yourself a liberal conservative, you've talked about compassionate conservatism. It's led by Rishi Sunak, and looks like it's going to be wiped out in 2024 by the Labour Party. This is your big party of the centre-left. Like most European Labour parties, it emerged out of the Labour disputes in the mid to late 19th century, based on the interests of the newly franchised urban working class. It rose quite quickly after being formed in 1900, at the expense of the once mighty Liberal Party, who collapsed massively. It was formed from trade unions, other smaller left-wing parties, and the Fabian Society, which is like an intellectual middle-class group of socialists, like for example Oscar Wilde was a member. If you are familiar with other parties similar to the Labour Party, like the SPD in Germany, or the PSOE in Spain, you'll be understand its basic principles, which is a strong welfare state, which they will often tell you that they created, which they did, the issues facing the working class, as well as fighting for social and economic justice. The party used to, or they will tell you that they represent the issues of the blue collar worker, like coal miners, factory workers, especially after Thatcher's Conservative government forcibly closed the mines. The two main factions in the Labour Party are the more ideological left, with democratic socialists, and then the more, you know, moderate members. 
These two parts of the party have clashed constantly and have done since the beginning. Donald and Henderson, putting Gatskillites and Bavanites, Jenkins and Foot, which caused Jenkins to leave the party, Kinnick and Bain, Blairites and Brownites, Corbynistas, you get the picture. Even issues like Israel and Palestine have divided the party. On Brexit, it was divided on some wanted to leave because the EU, they believe, represented global capitalism and neoliberalism. Others saw it as beneficial. It's led by Keir Starmer and has led the polls massively. The one criticism I have is, is it because Labour are offering a valid, popular, welcomed alternative? Or is it because of the unique unpopularity of the Conservatives and the various scandals and controversies that have embroiled the government caused their rise by default? So far, two parties. One on the centre-right, one on the centre-left. Pretty straightforward until we include the Liberal Democrats or Lib Dems. The Lib Dems came about from a union in 1983 between the old Liberal Party and at the time new Social Democratic Party, which broke away from the Labour Party for being too left-wing, hence the Liberal Democrats. The Liberals used to be juggernauts in British politics from the late 19th century to the early 20th century. Iconic Prime Ministers, well in my opinion, like Gladstone, Campbell Bannerman, David Lloyd George, all came from this party. Even Winston Churchill was a high-ranking Liberal Party member, but he switched once the party began to collapse electorally. This was for a number of reasons. It was essentially sandwiched between the Conservatives on their right and with the new Labour Party on its left. And members peeled off to one of those parties for reasons such as were they passionate on the Union or the Empire or were they involved in the trade union. This was quite rapid, going from 400 MPs in 1906 to just 40 in 1924. They introduced the basic welfare state, introducing pensions, etc. Today it promotes LGBT rights, abortion rights, you know, quite progressive things while also being very capitalist. Promoting free markets, lower taxes, Keynesian economics. John Maynard Keynes was actually a member of the Liberal Party. They're quite vocally pro-Europe, especially after Brexit, being for European integration. You think with the two main parties being broadly on board with Brexit, that the 16 million people who voted to stay in the EU would gravitate towards the Lib Dems. But no, that didn't happen. Why? Well, their 2010 coalition with the Conservatives. This nearly made the party go extinct in 2015. They were seen as contributing to austerity, they went back on a lot of their campaign pledges, most famously, they increased tuition fees, which they promised to scrap. Though before the election, Nick Clegg, who was its leader, had this media hype around him, called Cleggmania. Other things they advocate for is electoral f reform, which will obviously benefit them. As for factions, there isn't that many definable ones other than the Orange Book Liberals, which would be in the more right side of the party. People who vote for this party is mainly cultural in my opinion. Like, you know, upper middle class to upper class, mainly in the richer south of England. You know, the business class. People who see the Tories as too conservative and Labour as too left. With the, look at how moderate and sensible I am. And uh, the Shetland and Orkney Islands for some reason. In 2024, it's led by Sir Ed Davey, who looks like, at the moment, he will lead the party out from the dark past of the 2015 result. And they look to pick up some 50 seats, roughly. A party that's not looking like it's going to do well in 2024 is the Scottish National Party, SNP. The Scottish National Party's main policy focus is that of Scottish independence. Plain and simple. I've wrote a script for a video explaining left-wing nationalism, but it essentially it boils down to if the country it opposes for example, Scotland and the UK, being right-wing, either culturally, historically, politically, etc. Look at Catalonia or the Basque country in Spain, Ireland and the UK, or Canada opposing the US. Or even played Cymru and Wales, which is the Welsh National Party. But it's more or less irrelevant, so you can just swap the SNP with their name and they broadly have the same policies. The SNP promotes civic nationalism, which in my opinion is an adherence to liberalism and its principles, rather than ethno-nationalism, which is based on uh, ethnic, cultural, racial and linguistic lines. The party was formed in 1935 for various other Scottish independence movements. It is a rather unfortunate history of being linked to the Nazis during World War II, giving vocal support at times, with its leaders quietly supporting their war, like Andrew Gibb. Some even wanted a collaboration with government after Britain's fall, like Arthur Donaldson, who would be its leader in the 1960s. The enemy of my enemy is my friend is a crazy thing. In modern times, the party became dominated by Alex Salmon, who with devolution in 1977, led its first government in 2007, and has led Scotland ever since. Salmon resigned in 2014 amid sexual abuse allegations, and was replaced by Nicola Sturgeon, 
They pushed for the 2014 Scottish independence referendum in a once in a generation vote. But that didn't turn out the way they wanted so they continuously pushed for a second referendum. It reached its electoral peak in 2015 with it getting 56 seats out of a possible 59 in Scotland as it only runs for seats in Scotland, obviously. As for factions in the SNP, there are a couple. There's a divide over EU membership. The majority of the party are pro-EU, but some like Mahari Black are Eurosceptics questioning why Scotland, if it gets independence, should it give that newfound power over to the EU, which I think is a very valid point. They complain constantly about being run from Westminster, only to then want to be run by Brussels. There's quite a large section of the party that is part of the Calvinist Free Church of Scotland and is evangelical, so very socially conservative. Its main leader is Katie Forbes, who is the current Deputy First Minister and narrowly lost the 2023 SNP leadership race to Hamza Youssef. Now the SNP have hit a rough patch since longtime leader Nicola Sturgeon left due to corruption, fraud, embezzlement charges, as well as the press prying into her private life, as well as a controversial gender recognition bill which divided the party. Hamza Youssef himself being a pretty incompetent leader. The SNP is now led by Joe Swinney, who's trying to calm the chaos facing the party. What brought about that chaos was its coalition with the Greens. The Greens are a fairly new political party, being formed in the 1990s. They arose from protest movements like feminism, gay rights, anti-nuclear and of course environmentalism. To be honest, I don't think it's even fair to compare the other parties to the Greens. They have one MP, which is in Brighton, because of course it is. And that's despite all the airtime they are given. Like they are invited to all the political debates on BBC and ITV. They masquerade as a serious party, but they're not. Though I must acknowledge they have gained in strength over the years, however minuscule that is. Compare them to the German Greens for example. They are in government, or the third largest party, they got 15% of the vote, compared to the UK Greens 2%. Though it looks like they may benefit from left wing anger at Labour over the Israel Gaza war, going up to a possible 2 or 3 seats with Bristol Central looking a key target of theirs. As for factions, I'm not aware of any, but I presume there, are, there may be differences between Liberals, socialists and some more extreme eco-anarchists like Just Stop Oil, which has done more harm to the Green Movement. They supported leaving NATO, or at least did until very recently, removing the UK's nuclear weapons, large drug legalisation and very socialist economics. I wonder why this party isn't popular. If it wants to be a force in British politics it needs to moderate, but I feel like they've missed their chance years ago. All major parties agree on broad climate change. They have a consensus around that and they have policies in their manifestos to help combat that which just blunts or stunts their growth completely. So you can have green policies without the Green Party which brings into question why they even exist, as harsh as it is. However there is an even newer party that looks set to take this election by storm. They are Reform UK. So if the Conservative Party couldn't have it any worse with all those parties hitting them from the left, enter Reform who are hitting them from their right. Reform was founded by Nigel Farage, and whatever you think of him, good, bad, indifferent, whatever, he is an expert political operator. Farage is a figure who deserves his own video, so I'll try not to explain his life, but essentially he made Brexit mainstream. He was and is the father of Brexit. Reform came out of the Brexit party, which ran the 2019 European elections, and then transformed itself into Reform, which is failing 609 candidates across the UK. The party has been called far right, nationalist, right wing populist, and some even call them Nazis. Though whatever you call them reveals a lot more about you and your own political leanings than theirs. They advocate for electoral reform, replacing it with proportional representation, which will obviously benefit them. It's been quite remarkable to witness the rise of reform, with some polls actually placing them ahead of the Conservatives. Their policies include net zero migration, tax cuts, tough on crime policies, raising defence spending to 3% of GDP, eliminating the TV licence fee and being against woke culture among all their policies. They have not set their expectations though. If you've been on the internet at all you'll see hundreds of posts of people making reform memes and messages of support. But whether this turns into actual electoral success remains to be seen. Could they do a Canada in 1982 and with the Canadian Reform Party ousting their Conservatives from the right? Or could they do a 2019 Maxime Bernier People's Party with all that media hype and then turn that into zero seats? At the very least it looks like they'll get three seats with some very generous higher estimates giving them in the mid hundreds. 
So that's what I'll be most interested in looking for on July the 4th. Is the reform wave real? Or is it just a dribble of support? Time will tell. So I think that's all the major ones discussed. You do have like minor parties like the Workers Party, which is George Galloway's party and main focus is on Gaza. You also have the Alba party in Scotland, headed by former SNP leader Alex Salmond, which is a sort of more conservative SNP. So that covers it, I think. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed. I'd be interested in your opinion in the comments. Like and subscribe as well, of course. I've been History with Matt. Thank you very much for watching.